Hey guys, how's it going? Welcome to Evening Devotion. So quick update on my dad. Um, he is weaker. Um, he's gotten to the point where he doesn't think if he needs to have a bowel movement, he can even get back up out of the bed. Um, he still jokes around a little bit. Uh, listening to the radio. Uh, we got a, a one and a half spoonfuls of vegetable beef soup, soup in him yesterday, and that's it. Um, and he's only having like 12, 14 ounces of water a day, if that, sometimes less. So at this point, we're just trying to make him as comfortable as possible. But I mean, he's alert and paying attention. He slurs his speech a lot. Um, he's just, it's that time and his body's winding down. So that's where we're at on that. And um, it's, it's a, he never thought he would be in this position at the end of his life. And it's embarrassing for him because he's always been the person to do for himself. And he taught me to be that way. But I learned through my own circumstances, it's okay to ask for help. And so I'm glad he's here. I told him that the other night. I said, I told Diane this when she was in the same spot, exact same spot you're in right now. I said, I'm glad you're here versus anywhere else because who knows what kind of care you would get. And we already had some insights into what kind of care she would have got if she'd have been anywhere else. Um, but I told him the same thing. I'm glad you're here. It's here. We're not going to take advantage of you and we're not going to treat you badly. We're going to care for you just like we would anyone else. And he didn't want it to have to be that way. He hated that, that we have to do this. And I was like, it's an honor for me to do it. I, mean, I, I told, I told him too, this is like almost a week ago. I said, um, this is a way that, that I can honor you is by caring for you in your final moments. So that's where we're at on that. It's not easy. There's nothing easy about it. But the Lord does give a great amount of peace, and I am super thankful for that. And uh, he gives me the ability to get up and do what i got to do every day. I gained back 15 pounds of the weight that I lost uh, just in, in a, a couple of weeks. And I don't know why, because I, ha I haven't, I don't eat anymore than I normally do. So I guess, I'm guessing it's just stress. But um, I'll lose it. I've already managed to lose a couple of pounds. Um, so yeah, I mean, it is what it is. Those of you that have gone through stuff like this, you know exactly what the process is. You, you know where the thought process is. But this has been a very unique experience for me personally and for my wife in that so much has so many blessings. I can't even count all the blessings that have come out of this. Just amazing, amazing stuff. And on top of that, my mom had mouth surgery. They put those inserts up into your jaw so that you can reattach a tooth. Um, and uh, so they had to they had to use a little hammer pound up in there, make a little opening and all that, and then seal it in there. And so her face is still swollen. She has to heal up from that. So I have to go out to her house every day and uh, feed horses. And whatever else pops up that needs to be done. Tomorrow I got to go mow and I got to, there's a, one of the old, the power line to the well um, fell down. The support poles fell down. So I got to go see if I can do something with that. Yeah, weird stuff. It just I, I sometimes I'm just in awe of how things unfold. I'm in awe of, of how things how things develop. It's just amazing to me how the Lord does things, how things unfold. But and with this with the certain frame of mind that you look at those things from a biblical perspective, a, a Christian perspective, it's vastly different than what the world looks at it as. Amazing. And and there, there'll be more to tell. There'll be a whole lot more to tell when this as this develops and, and moves to its final stages, and even after, especially after. I'm going to do a video uh, on my dad, just like I did for my mother-in-law, after everything is said and done. Um, so yeah, unique perspectives and unique interactions in a very strange time in human history. Okay, so tonight we will not be reading out of John one seven. Because the verse quoted is not John 1 7, it's 1 John 1 7. If we walk in the light as he is in the light. Now, don't get me wrong, John 1 7 is great. I was kind of excited. I was like, really? We're going to read out of John 1 7? But I didn't look at the verse. I just went there and I was looking, compared them, and I'm like, oh, wait a minute. That's not right. Because the, the first um, 10 verses 
of John, the first chapter of John, are amazing. Um, so let's go to 1 John 1, 7 and start reading. So the whole verse says, But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Walk in the light. What does that look like? Well, have integrity, first of all. Do the right thing by everybody, even your enemies. Bless and do not curse. Walk upright. That means don't get involved in stuff that you know you shouldn't get involved in. Now, there are some extreme circumstances where it may be, you know, pulling somebody out of the fire. But those are case-by-case -case basis. But the general practice of life should be to stay away from those things that you know you shouldn't get involved in. It's real easy. All right, let's get the context. We're going to start in verse 1, the word of life. Now, it's interesting. The word of life is the, is the title of 1 John uh, 1. But if you go over to, what's it at there? It's John 1. The word became flesh. So both of these first chapters are about the word, are about Jesus, and refers to him as the word. Very interesting. Uh, first John, where are we at? I lost it. There he is. One John, one, one. Well, let's make that one John, one seven. So we see our verse. There we go. All right. Verse one, that which was from the beginning. And so immediately this links you back to the first chapter of John. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled concerning the word of life. The, you hear somebody say the word of life, that's Jesus Christ. The life was manifested, and we have seen and bear witness and declare to you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested to us. Jesus Christ is our eternal life. It's right there in the text. That which we have seen and heard, we declare to you that you also may have fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And these things we write to you, that your joy may be full. It's a beautiful, beautiful understanding. Those who know the Lord, those who know, the, the even familiar with the Scriptures, you don't have to know them perfectly, even just being familiar with the Scriptures, those who grasp the concept, have greater knowledge than anyone else. You can know nothing but know, every, know, but know about the Lord and know more than other people. This is high knowledge. To know about this the world looks down on it how interesting that the world does and it's no surprise they do this is high knowledge knowing about the lord walking in the light verse 5 this is the message which we have heard from him and declare to you that god is light and in him is no darkness at all if we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness we lie and do not practice the truth a great many people today do that It's an extremely high degree. It's scary how subtle it is sometimes. It's scary how much a person can look like a Christian in all aspects of life and yet not be that. If we say that we have fellowship in him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son cleanses us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is in us. There's a great many people saying that today. You can be sinless. I had a guy tell me that years ago. You can be sinless too. Last week, I was sinless six out of seven days. And I was like, well, hold on a second. So you're telling me you can achieve the same thing that only one other person has ever done in the history of the world, and that's Jesus Christ. If you can be sinless, why do you need salvation? The whole point of salvation is to save us from our sins. So if you can be sinless, you don't need saving. And I told him, I said, that's a scary concept. Because that means you're going to get to heaven on your own merits. And the Bible strictly explains you cannot get to heaven on your own merits. So that's scary. And I quoted him 1 John 1 8. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. And the truth is not in us. Everyone has sin. Period. There's no debate here. People want to argue over words all day long. No. You have sin. I got into actually a really long conversation with a lady, and it ended very well. And it was a video years ago. I saw a video she had on her channel. I don't think she does videos anymore. 
Um, and we had a long, long, long conversation about this. And she ended up emailing me. I asked her to email me so we could have a longer conversation. We had a long discussion on this, many emails and comments. And I told her, I said, there is no way that you can achieve this. And I thought for sure she was starting to come around. But I think somebody got to her and reaffirmed what she believed that she can be sinless. And I told her, I said, ma'am, if you have sin that is unforgiven in the Lord, you are lost. You have sin right now, but it must be forgiven in the Lord Jesus Christ due to his, the covering of his blood. If you think you are sinless now by your acts, by your abilities, your works are filthy rags, you are not, you are not saved if you say you're doing it. Because if you're doing it, what is there? What need is there of Christ? You're by default. You're excluding yourself from salvation because you think you can pull something off only one person has ever done. Him. We had a long conversation about this. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Don't lie about your sin. Don't hide your sin. Don't ignore your sin. Confess it, Lord. I made a mistake. Okay. My blood, my grace is sufficient for you. If we say that we have not sinned, which a lot of people are doing, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. John is being very clear here. He's reiterating the point multiple times. If you walk in darkness, you are not saved. You don't practice the truth. If you say you have no sin, you're a liar and you have no truth. If you say you haven't sinned, you're a liar. And you have no truth. Your His word is not in you. There is a lot of people today that are doing that, that they believe that. I still have sin. I can't get rid of it myself. I need him. I need him for that. I need him to save me for myself. And every other human being that's walked this earth, is walking this earth, or will walk this earth, is going to have sin. You, the literal, you're born into the first sin because we're all descendants of Adam. Adam sinned, all the generations following have that first sin, have that sin. It's, it's on you by default. Now, the Lord overlooks certain things because of the age of accountability. So in children, it's a little different. But once you hit that age of accountability where you can understand these things, you're accountable. Amazing. Amazing. There are a great many people that are walking in darkness today and don't even realize it. As he is in the light, can we ever attain to this? Shall we ever be able to walk as clearly in the light as he is, whom we call our Father, of whom it is written, God is light, and in him is no darkness at all? Certainly this is the model which is set before us. For the Savior himself said, Be ye perfect, even as your Father who is heaven is perfect. Now, the people I've mentioned and talked about, they love to quote that verse. The Lord told you be perfect. How? So you tell me how to do that. And they would tell me how they're doing it. No, no, no. You know how you be perfect? <laughs> Faith and trust in Jesus Christ. And he will make you perfect. Not in this life, but in the next one. And although we may feel that we can never rival the perfection of God, yet we are to seek after it. What does Jesus say? Strive to enter by the narrow gate. We work towards that. Now, we can't claim that we have it because we can't attain it in this life. The flesh, sin is, is imprisoned in the flesh. I don't care how sinless you think you are, you still have sin because it is imprisoned in your flesh. And it's going to stay here on this earth with this body. Yet we are to seek after it and never to be satisfied until we attain to it. The day of redemption reveals that to us. The youthful artist, as he grasps his early pencil, can hardly hope to equal Raphael or Michelangelo. But still, if he did not have a noble a noble bow ideal before his mind, he would only attain to something very mean and ordinary. But what is meant by the expression that the Christian is to walk in light as God is in the light? We conceive it to import likeness, but not degree. That's the secret. We are to exemplify those characteristics. So, let me throw something out here. Everybody can understand. How many people out there hate Donald Trump? A lot. How many people out there love him? A lot. You can exude and exemplify the characteristics of Donald Trump. Look like him, talk like him, act like him, use the same catchphrases and all that. 
and say, this is my name, but you can't be Donald Trump. I can exude or exemplify or, or, um, or, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, lost it. I had no lost it. I can radiate these qualities. I can live these qualities of God. I can, I can attain to a certain level of them, but I cannot be God. A lot of people today are telling themselves that too. You're a little God. No, you're not. Stephen Furtick needs to shut up. He keeps telling people, I am, I am God and you are not God. Not even close. Those other guys, we're going to be little gods in heaven. No, that's Mormonism. It's not Christianity. We will not be little gods. We conceive it to import likeness, but not degree. So you will have familiar characteristics of Christ and of the Father, because you are his child, because you are saved by the Lord. These natural tendencies will go towards that. The more you read the Bible, the more you change your walk, the, the more you bear that fruit of those things and glorify the Lord in your, in your actions. But we can't be him, not in this flesh. And that's what we strive for, to get as close as we can. The Lord is the one that takes us the rest of the way. He finishes the work he started in us. We don't finish the work, he finishes the work. We are as truly in the light, we are as heartily in the light, we are as sincerely in the light, as honestly in the light, though we cannot be there in the same measure. We're seated in heavenly places. Do you know what heaven looks like? I don't, but the Bible says I'm seated there, so I believe it. I don't know what it's like because I'm not all the way there yet. See? I cannot dwell in the sun. It is too bright a place for my residence. But I can walk in the light of the sun. And so, though I cannot attain to that perfection of purity and truth, which belongs to the Lord of hosts by nature as the infinitely good, yet I can set the Lord always before me and strive by the help of the indwelling spirit after conformity to his image. Literally what I just told you. Strive to enter by the narrow gate. What does that look like? What the Bible tells you. Do this, don't do this. Stay away from these things, attain to these things. These, these characteristics should follow somebody who's indwelled of the Holy Spirit. And there's several places in the New Testament that give those qualities of the Holy Spirit. And those should be uh, at some level, at some measure, you're not gonna have it to the fullest, within your lifestyle that you live. Will you be perfect at it? Nope, not to this side of heaven, but we will on the other side of heaven. It's the Holy Spirit that changes us. That's sanctification. It's literally sanctification. And we're all in that process right now. That famous old commentator, John Trapp, says, We may be in the light as God is in the light for quality, but not equality. See, God is the light. Jesus is the light. They're in the center of it. We have to stand in the outskirts of it. I tell you this, if the Lord in his glory appeared right in front of you, you would probably go blind because the light of his glory is so bright and intense. You can't stand in that light yet. You don't have a body that can withstand it. Same with his love. We are to have the same light and are as truly to have it and walk in it as God does, though, as for equality with God in his holiness and purity, that must be left until we cross the Jordan and enter into the perfection of the Most High, Mark that the blessings of sacred fellowship and perfect cleansing are bound up with walking in the light. So he literally told you just what I told you. You're not going to attain to it here. But we can get close. We can have a, a life that is a model of those things. And that will become a, a, a picture or a mirror reflecting the Lord we walk after. We will become that. But there will still be aspects of our old life that are still going to shine through every now and then. You can't help it. You still have that there. I still get angry sometimes. I can't help it. I still get frustrated sometimes. I still lose my cool sometimes. Swear word comes flying out before I can stop myself. It happens because I'm not perfect right now. That perfection comes later when the Lord takes us up. When we have that new body, that mansion, we shed this tent, this mortal coil, and take on a new body that is perfect. Then we will be perfected then we will be made into what we are being made into right now. Then it will be finished. 
the day of redemption will reveal all those things. But here, we can strive for it. We can go close to it. And where we fall short, we go to the Lord. Lord, I fall short every day. Make me to walk after you. Let's pray right now on that. Lord, we come before you this evening to praise you, honor you, and glorify you. And to lift you up. Lord, you are the most gracious, the most patient, and the most loving. I ask, Lord, on behalf of all my brethren around the world, even though we can't be perfect, Lord, even though we can't do it exactly right, that you make us and give us the ability, we're willing, give us the ability and the skills and the attitude and make us to walk after you as much as is possible within each one of us. Some of us can go more than others. That's why we, we help each other out. But Lord, I pray that you give each one of us according to our ability, according to our measure of the Holy Spirit, the ability to walk after you, to strive to enter by the narrow gate like you told us to, to, to become as close to you as we can. And the, so the world can see it. We can't be perfect. We're not going to be this side of heaven, but we know there's a day coming when you will finish that work and make us perfect. But until then, Lord, may we walk after you. Give us the ability to walk after you. Give us that attitude, that mindset, that, that frame of mind and way of thinking and way of walking that mirrors your qualities. May the Holy Spirit shine through each one of us. So that way we glorify you all the more every day in our lives. I can't heal anybody, but I want to. I can't cast out any demons who I haven't had an opportunity to. Um, I can't be exactly like you, even though I want to be. But Lord, I know that you will help all of us get as close as possible before that great day comes when you return to collect us. That way we will be shining lights, salt of the earth, Beacons of truth to a lost and dying world that desperately, desperately needs it. It's all for your glory, Lord, that we may be a living example, a living a, a glory to you. And that we may bring honor to your name in the life that we live. And Lord, where we fall short, where we make mistakes, Lord, please forgive us. Please forgive us. Because we're going to do it. We don't like that we do it, but we know we're going to do it. It's for your glory and to the praise of your holy name. And it is in your name that we pray all these things according to your will. May they be done. Amen. Guys, thank you for joining me for evening devotion. A lot of people out there really got a weird idea about this stuff because they've been led in the dark. They've been deceived. And it makes them angry. Deep down, they know what they believe is the truth. I've come to this conclusion a long, come to this a long time ago. Deep down, they, they know that, that what they believe isn't true. They know that they know what the Bible says, and it's a constant uh, little sticker. You know, down here in Texas, we got them little, we call them sandburrs. And uh, when well, you get one stuck in your skin, it's it got a little hook on the end of it, and it breaks off, and it's irritating, and it's hard to remove. It's like a little sticker that's constantly poke, 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 and they don't know what to do. It, it, because... They're so steeped in that false doctrine, it's hard for them to lay that down and come over and stand in the light because they feel like if they turn away from that, something bad's going to happen. And this is just a conclusion I've come to from talking to literally hundreds of people over the last five years, five and a half, well, five and a half, over five and a half years. So since they know the truth, they're not going to have an excuse on the day the Lord says, okay, well, look, it's right here in the book. Now, don't misunderstand, a lot of those people are going to come around. So, uh, I think a lot of them are going to be the ones that are going to be the great multitude in the sixth seal. When they're, or, you know, in between the sixth and seventh seal, they're suddenly going to come to life and wake up and go, uh-oh, I made a huge mistake. I believed wrong this whole time. Lord, forgive me. And he will, and he will bring them up. How? I don't know. Probably going to mean their death. Are going to be a lot of suffering. I mean, a third of the, well, it's a quarter or a third uh, of mankind around the world is going to die just in the seals. That's not counting the tribulation. The seals are, are, are different. And, and of course, there's a lot of people out there that, that say, oh no, it's all wrapped up together. Well, that's not possible because if it's all wrapped up together, how is it the trumpets don't start until the seventh seal breaks? 
Seals are first, then the trumpets. And then the vials and bowls are contained within the trumpets because it's a trumpet blast that sets those off. So just got to read the text. So the Lord hasn't abandoned them. He, he will get them. Those that, that are for sure his. And only he knows who they are. But what we can do now is we can live that way. Now we can be a living example now for those people. They're not going to like us. They're going to hate you. But you know what? Some of them might come around. Some of them might stop and reconsider and go, you know what? I, I'm reading the scriptures and they make good points. I, I think I need to swing the other way. And I think deep down I already knew this whole time that that was the right way to do it instead of the way I was doing it. And they will come across. The Lord will bring them over. So we live as an example for the rest of the world to see, even the rest of the quote-unquote church. Because look at the state of them. Look at, look at the state of the church today. It's terrible. Terrible what they're allowing. And yet, for some reason, they just refuse to see it. I say this as my opinion. But I wonder if the worldwide church, 2.7 billion plus or minus people, if they were to turn and repent... And all at once, they we all kneeled down and we all prayed. I wonder if it would change the timing of the rapture and the tribulation. I don't know. I mean, it's not going to happen. Bible prophecy has to be fulfilled. But I wonder if, if in the grand scheme of things, if that was a possibility, if 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 the Lord would would relent. Me and my dad have talked about this for years. What if that happened? Would he relent? I don't know. But I'll tell you one thing. That light would shine a whole lot brighter if all 2.7 plus or minus billion of us were walking after him like we're supposed to. And believing the word as it's presented like we're supposed to. And trusting and hoping in him for all things like we're supposed to. But guys, there's a remnant, and we're we're part of it. Just the remnant, a little, small, tiny, maybe fifty million. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know how many of us there are. It could be even less than that. I don't know how many of us are that that are in the faith that are actually walking. I know it's just a small percentage. Now that's not the entire church. The entire church is a little bigger than that. But the bride is a very small percentage. I don't know. My hope is that they all get granted repentance and they turn and follow after the Lord so we can all go to heaven together. I don't know how it's going to play out because I don't know what the Lord's plan is except for what's in the Bible. <laughs> so I have to have to read that and rely on that. But what an amazing thing. An amazing thing. To consider if all of us stopped and in unison, day and night, all around the, t the whole earth, in all time zones, every single one of us that names the name of Christ would stop and would kneel down the best we can. Some of us mm -hmm. some of us struggle with that and pray to the Lord and glorify him. What would that change? What would that do? What effect would that have? The earth might stop turning. I don't know. But it sure is something amazing to think about. And it would be even more amazing to see it happen. <laughs> One day, all of heaven and all the earth will do that. They will glorify the Lord. Right now, it's not that day. But we're looking forward to that day, guys. And while we walk this path, while we strive, while we are being sanctified, we get as close as we can and we do what we can and we pray and take everything to him we can. Praise him and glorify him and give thanks to him as much as we can. And and we become living examples of the Holy Spirit within us. Those qualities exuding from us. Those qualities being expressed in our daily lives. So that, you know, a large portion of our life will be lived to glorify him. Living sacrifices for the Lord. You do it every day and sometimes don't even realize it. All of us do. I love you all very much. I bless you all in Jesus' name, and I'll see you in the next video.